Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. My name is Joe Phelan. I work for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I'm based um, with our team in Delhi. Thank you very much for joining this virtual event today. The subject is sustainability in growth impacted scenarios. Um, this is a, a, an important subject that is central to our mission. And for today, we've organized a, a, a panel uh, to discuss this topic with you and uh, we've arranged for a moderator. So Nasima Aurora will be our moderator today. Um, she's the Deputy Director General of the Confederation of Indian Industries and uh, CII, the Confederation of Indian Industries, is a long-term partner of the World Business Council and our lead partner um, in India. Um, I'm based in India also but this event um, is on the subject of sustainability and growth impacted scenarios wherever your businesses are operating. And we hope that you find it um, informative um, and a, a good opportunity also to put forward your ideas and, uh, and to challenge and ask the speakers that we have today. Um, let me just say a little bit about the World Business Council. So we're committed uh, to enabling business leadership for a sustainable future. We represent 200 multinational companies from all sectors and all geographies, but united around a single common vision of a world where over 9 billion people all live well and live within the limits of the planet by 2050. I think uh, for as long as we've been going and uh, you know, day by day, that mission becomes more relevant and more urgent. Um, I mentioned that we are an organization of some 200 global companies. And you can see on the screen here, uh, the, the companies that make up our membership on which set our agenda and drive forward our programs. Um, these programs are organized around the transformation of six uh, systems, six systems that are critical to a sustainable life for, for all the people on the planet. The, the circular economy, buying the material system, the whole urban uh, and trans system, the energy system that we all rely on, um, feeding the world nutritiously um, within what's possible on, on, on the planet. Um, the whole system of people as employees and, and consumers. Um, and lastly, what we call the redefining value, which is really about the, the capital system and transforming that system so that it more efficiently allocates capital to the most sustainable businesses. And that's because ultimately we're working to create the conditions where the most sustainable businesses will be recognized and rewarded. And ultimately we're about sustainable business success, uh, business resilience and sustainable businesses seizing opportunity. Um, the world has changed for all of us incredibly rapidly over the last two months. And WBCSD alongside these programs has organized um, to deliver three projects, three short-term projects to help our members with um, some of the challenges that have come about as a result of COVID-19. So a project on sustaining vital supply chains during this crisis, especially the food system, a program to help members um, with scenarios focused on employee health and business recovery as we, as we um, move back to this new normal um, program really looking at the long-term impacts of um, the learning from this crisis and how we can apply that into business strategy for our members. So the three programs which um, together our members are, are taking forward, especially in response to COVID-19. I mentioned that this meeting is part of, is, is a virtual meeting and it's part of a series. So we've been running these meetings now. This is the third week. We run meetings like this every Monday and every Wednesday and we run them at this time which is 10 a.m. in Central Europe. Um, it's a time that's convenient for people in Europe and in Asia and we will run this same webinar or this same virtual meeting with, a, with, with the same subject but a different set of speakers and a different audience will run at 4 p.m. this afternoon European time um, and that's a, at a time that's convenient again for people in Europe but also people in the Americas. And you can, you can find this, the listing of all the meetings that we're running 
on this URL that's on the screen at the moment. Um, and that's also the URL where we post the recordings of the session and where we uh, post the slides. So you will be able to access um, all the materials and the discussion that there is today and you'll be able to share that with people in your teams and, and your colleagues and so on. A few things on logistics and housekeeping. So you will have seen when you joined this session today is being recorded and all participants are muted. We would really like you to post your questions uh, by using the chat function. Um, and you can also raise your hand and if we're able to, we'll come to you so that you can verbalize that question. But what we found is that the chat function is gets used the most. So please do put your questions there. Um, a couple more things just to share with you. So as with any um, organization, uh, any meeting arranged by the World Business Council, because um, we're a commercial, or our members are a commercial organization, it's essential that we are aware of antitrust practicalities and that we avoid any discussion on the panel or in the chat of anything that is commercially sensitive, such as pricing, bid strategies, output decisions, and future capacity additions, and so on. So just a request for everyone to be mindful of that. And then the last bit of housekeeping is to ask you all to open a browser on your device um, alongside, um, alongside this call um, and go to menti.com because we're going to ask you three questions today and we want to um, get your views on a few subjects. And we'll combine that also with the data that we get from later on today when we run this webinar again. So if you could all please go to menti.com and um, be ready to answer the questions that are there. And apologies for the background noise where I am. Um, that's the introduction. Um, it, it, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Seema Aurora for the, the, the meat of this uh, virtual meeting with panel discussion. Um, and and as you can see this agenda here, we will end with a QA. and a um, We've committed that this session will be 90 minutes. It will end by 11.30 a.m. Central European time. Um, and I look forward to uh, a great discussion and um, a, a lot of questions from everybody. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Joe. for uh, in the introductions. Um, let me add my welcome to the session on sustainability in a growth impacted scenario. Um, I also want to welcome my co-panelists uh, whom I will uh, briefly introduce. Uh, today's speakers, uh, we have uh, Tony Henshaw, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of the Aditya Birla Group. Mr. Ramnath Vedinathan, who is General Manager Sustainability of the Codridge Group. Both the companies are highly diversified companies and therefore we will get a very, very useful set of varied insights. And finally, Mr. Arindam Datta, who is Executive Director, Rabobank, coming from a financial sector company. And it's so very important in this scenario when we are going through this crisis to have insights from how the financial sector is viewing this. So this is our panel today. Um, as we start uh, this, af this afternoon, um, it is important for us to take a minute to ponder on the question of how companies, what is the link between sustainability and competitiveness for companies? And we have a bunch of slides which would help us understand the relationship. Like I said, in this COVID world and the pandemic, there's so much of disruption that's happened. Uh, the economies are disrupted, our lives are disrupted, and also the financial markets are disrupted. But there is something that we can track and see to find if there is a link between what we are discussing today and how companies have fared. These, these bunch of slides, the first slide, as you can see, is really about the ESG performance of companies in emerging markets. And as we see this, we can see that a lot of companies in emerging markets who have you know, been uh, working on ESG uh, uh, issues have been outperforming. Similar is the case uh, with the companies 
in a developed developing country like india as you can see but what's more interesting is the next two slides which are uh, a mapping of the uh, you know the esg performance of companies uh, during the covid crisis and we see 31 north american companies mapped on this slide where the stocks weathered the downturn much better now there could be many reasons but definitely one of the reasons that comes to mind is this that if you are a company which is embedded esg into your business model you certainly are looking long term you certainly have plans which are going to include contingency plans whether it is from a governance point of view whether it's from a social point of view or an environmental point of view and i think this is what these two slides which are talking about the north american companies and even the european companies and both these come from the uh, basket of the wbcsd members they are really outperforming because they are looking long term they had contingency plans they treat governance they treat all these issues very importantly let us now jump into our you know um, next part of the uh, discussion and at this stage i would like you to please uh, as joe had mentioned uh, quickly go into the menti.com uh, portal and use the uh, code that is given on your screens uh, to uh, put in your choice the questions there are four options for the question what is the most crucial area in which your sustainability function uh, adds value to the business so if you could quickly do that and as we are speaking i think we have the results as well and i i do see that mm -hmm. very interesting <laughs> very interesting <laughs> so clearly resources is one of the largest uh, you know most crucial area that's coming up from the results the second most crucial is stakeholder engagement and i think this is true because as we are going through these covid times and even as business as usual the companies find the maximum value in a strategy which is driven towards optimizing resource use a sustainability strategy and i think stakeholder engagement is a bedrock of any sustainability strategy so i think this is really really uh, important you know uh, uh, and an insight which we expect our audience and our companies to really you know think about with this um, i would like to also now get the panelists involved in our discussion at this stage and i'm going to start as i said you know we have uh, you know uh, Uh, two of our uh, uh, two of our members from WBCSD who are basically you know uh, working in the uh, different scenarios uh, different sectors and as as we can see uh, uh, it's important to understand from them and maybe i would start by asking tony and uh, followed by uh, ram the question on how has your business align sustainability with competitiveness and what has been your uh, company's approach towards this so if i may please request tony followed by ram to give their insights thank you suma um very good afternoon to everybody and thanks to the world world business council for the invitation um i think it's really quite interesting when you look at um what's happened now in this uh short period of time and start to compare it to longer term risk um what what we've done at the dichibola group we're a 50 billion dollar conglomerate we're in many many different sectors um but we have moved away from sustainability and started to define sustainable <clears throat> as to whether the businesses we have will be around in the future and our uh goal is to build sustainable businesses that are capable of living in the world of 2030 2050 um so we've done a lot of work <coughs> to um work on um improving our management systems so that we reduce our side effects and our contribution to the decay of the planet 
Um, but we've also acknowledged that the planet, as it gets worse, uh, climate change, particularly biodiversity, will have impacts on our business. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time looking at long-term risk management. And we think, um, I personally think it's great to see uh, Arindom here today because the banks are now starting to get involved and they're starting to question uh, whether businesses are managing their long-term risks. Um, I, I think the COVID epidemic has um, really sharpened our focus on the value of our supply chain. Um, we're still looking for tools to map the supply chain uh, right down to tier five and six so that we know that in the future, um, uh, where we've seen the supply chain break now, um, we know that as climate change and other impacts start to hit us, um, our supply chains are going to be vulnerable. So I think there's a great message um, that we can all learn from, uh, from what we're seeing. So, as I said, um, we've probably gone further than just competitiveness. We've defined sustainable as survival. Uh, are we actually able to operate the business that we've created um, in the world of, of 2030, 2050? And that's a world much like the COVID world, because it's going to be highly controlled. Um, governments are going to have to put out regulations to um, force businesses to operate in a different way. Uh, change products, change operations, even change geographies. And when that happens, um, only businesses that have uh, good management teams and foresight will be in the right place at the right time. So we've spent uh, a, a lot of effort uh, in, in trying to understand uh, the future. If you go to our website at, at jubilla.com and the sustainability page, you will find a paper that we wrote um, coping with a 2 degree world and we, we wrote that paper um, mainly because most people we talked to didn't understand what a 2 degree world might be like. Uh, it is slightly hotter, we understand, but uh, vast changes in water supplies, vast changes in um, legal requirements, other things uh, are going to impact the way we're able to operate. So as I say, we've we've probably accepted it's going to make us competitive um, but in the long term it's actually going to make us sustainable and survivable um, and that, that's what we've been focusing on. Thank you Tony. I think uh, I would like now uh, to invite Ram to actually give his views how your business is, has aligned sustainability and what's been your company's approach. Thank you, Seema. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, everyone's able to hear me. And uh, thank you, WBCST, for organizing this session. A very relevant session, it is as well. Uh, to cut to the chase, for sustainability had gone along very similar lines to what Tony had just mentioned. It's very much an intrinsic part of our strategy. And uh, I would not say it was always the same case. Uh, so, broadly, sustainability at Godrej falls into the idea of being good and being green, just having a positive social as well as an environmental impact in everything we do. Uh, this journey of good and green first started in formally in around 2010. Of course, a lot of these sustainability activities have been associated with the Godri's group much longer than that. Uh, but in 2010, there was a conscious decision to formalize it and have very defined targets uh, that we wanted to achieve by 2020, which uh, most of it, which we have been successful at. And now we're at the cusp of the next uh, defining our strategy for the next five years. And uh, there's been a lot of learnings along the way. And one of which is uh, sustainability inevitably begins uh, with the idea of resource efficiency. Uh, because fundamentally, uh, the easiest way and the earliest, the lowest, lowest hanging fruits in sustainability are the ones that have an immediate cost benefit. So improving your efficiencies in your supply chain, in your processes, uh, in the way you work and adopting alternative uh, technologies and uh, investing in large capex uh, grade investments which have a uh, good ROI, I would say, is what initially drives sustainability strategy. Uh, but uh, having seen the really, really positive effects and getting the buy-in of all the stakeholders in implementing these resource efficiencies, uh, we've now, like what Tony had mentioned, and I completely agree with that sentiment, it's no longer something that's an add-on or, you know, it's, it's not about competitiveness. It's purely about uh, survival and being the last few standing at the end because 
well, the ones that are prepared the earliest uh, from a sustainability standpoint, not just in terms of uh, managing the resources better, but also in terms of uh, adding back positive value to the environment as well as society. I think you will see a lot more, uh, uh, you'll see this being translated into tangible uh, business results uh, as we go forward. Just to give you an example, the idea of having a carbon price or an internal water price is something that has completely changed the idea of how we look at, uh, you know, a return of um, ROIs for green projects. Because what we realize is very often the cost of mitigation is uh, much higher than the uh, early cost of uh, adaptation. So I would say that you know, uh, sustainability has now become very much a fundamental intrinsic part of the corporate strategy itself at Godrich. Uh, it very much, I mean, so the uh, be it our uh, social projects which we do using our CSR funds, be it the uh, resource efficiency projects or the energy efficiency projects that we do within the fence as well as the green projects we do beyond the fence. Uh, a lot of it is, it's, it stems from our fundamental corporate strategy of where we want to be and what we want to stand for as a business. Uh, so, you know, uh, something as uh, very interesting that's come up in our journey for the next five years is we wanted to look at uh, uh, sustainable consumption and how we can influence that. Because traditionally, that has not been something that we've been able to touch upon. Uh, but uh, we realized that for business, as a business, for us to be sustainable and be uh, competitive and survive, uh, we will need to start influencing our customers to start uh, behaving in a more sustainable manner as well. It's no good just us, uh, you know, adopting practices within our fence. So uh, I would say with regards to the COVID pandemic in particular, what we've realized is that this is probably these kind of occurrences are going to happen more frequently uh, as we go forward and uh, climate uh, and, uh, you know, if we can make these changes and, you know, diminish without diminishing our uh, productivity and our efficiency, if we're able to adopt new ways of working, why can't we look at that as a longer term solution to work in a more sustainable manner? Already we are seeing that, you know, uh, apart from, you know, if you even see the factories, uh, many of our factories where something as, uh, you know, something we take usually for granted is labor, may not entirely be the same once we come back to some degree of normalcy post this, uh, uh, post the lockdown, post the pandemic, we may have to look at greater automation and uh, that may unlock further uh, efficiencies. So I think it's a completely, we're preparing ourselves for a completely new world and a completely new way of working. What we've done so far has prepared us well for what we want to do, but uh, there is a lot of collaboration required among industry itself, uh, the consumers themselves and in influencing long-term changes in behavior, as well as with the government in order to be able to prepare the entire industry and you know, prepare the nation as a whole for a more sustainable way of uh, working going forward. So we believe we're well prepared for that, uh, but it's there are a lot of learnings which we're getting and as we speak, uh, in, uh, living through this pandemic. Thank you, Ram. That's uh, very helpful. And let me just uh, now turn to our uh, uh, panelists uh, from the financial sector. Are in the um, so you heard, you know, how companies are uh, embedding sustainability. What are their approaches? Now, finance is the lifeline for any company, and it's. Uh, I would like to hear from you uh, that how do you screen and direct investments towards sustainable businesses? How do you make sure that more and more companies do what Aditya Billa Group, Godrej Group are doing? So over to you, Arindam. Thanks, Seema. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, uh, World Business Council. And thank you to my two panelists, Ram and Tony, for you know, setting the stage and making it a lot easier for me. Well, uh, as Tony and Ram mentioned, for us as a financial institution to survive, we need to ensure that our clients survive. And if in 2050, 2060, if a client survive, then we also survive as a financial institution. And that's where sustainability becomes extremely important. Now, we as a financial group, we are a Dutch bank, uh, and we are the world's largest financial institution in food and agribusiness, a very complicated, high-risk business globally. Now, uh, what we do, and this is extremely important, is before we onboard any client, and uh, any client across segment, whether it's a retail client, a semi client, or a corporate client, anywhere in the world, in any sector, we do a <clears throat> deep dive into the uh, sustainability journey of a to-be client. And we look at first the mission statement. We look at the transparency as to 
have they put it out in the public about what their aim is so far as sustainability goals are concerned and then we deep dive further to see what kind of resources knowledge they have how well they understand their supply chain this is extremely important it's never a client on a standalone basis but the entire supply chain of the commodity of the produce that the client is in do they understand and do they also ensure that all the supply chain players are in the same journey as them so it's very very important to understand as to how a corporate how a business makes its money not how it spends it but how it makes its money and how sustainable it is we have different kind of frameworks whether we call it the the stg or the esg parameters but what we do is we force our relationship manager our frontline managers our account manager and the risk team to put a rating on each and every client and this rating ranges from a to d plus with a being the front runners the industry front runners b the industry uh, businesses which are almost there they need to take a few more steps c are the laggards d and d plus are the unsustainable companies which are not acceptable and then once we do this analysis it's integrated into the risk management system of the bank so a d and d plus is outright rejected a b and c client would only be onboarded if we get a firm commitment about a time bound program for them to move on in the sustainability journey and we need firm commitments with deadlines of what are the actions they are going to do how they are going to do it how much resources they are willing to put into that we do the whole hog exercise and once the risk is acceptable from a sustainability perspective that it is put up for approval uh, internally as a bank how do we monitor a portfolio so in the early days what we used to do we used to see the number of clients who were rated a to d plus we wanted to increase the percentage of a and b clients we have been doing that over a period of time and now we are forcing not a rating but a number a fixed number to every client whether it's a 3.8 or 4.2 out of 5 on a scale of 5 we are forcing a number on every client and then on the weighted average Uh, uh every month we are monitoring as to how our portfolio is increasing uh, uh so uh, on top of that now as was mentioned earlier by tony and ram the climate reporting of a clients and of our own footprints is getting extremely extremely important it's complicated because it's a very evolving subject and that's what rabo bank is now working on is how to measure the climate footprint of our clients in different parts of the agri supply chain i'll stop here for the time being thank you thank you arundham that that's very very helpful and i think um, this insight um, is very helpful for our members and the people to understand that how the financial sector and banks like you are becoming so serious about these issues um let's move on to our uh, you know next mentimeter question uh, which will just come up on the slide um what we asking is and if you could please go to the uh, website again menti.com and the code remains the same 848268 so how has your role or your department's role changed in the current covid-19 situations so this is something that we would like to hear from you please take a minute to put in your uh, you know choice there so is it co-creating is it evolutionary is it more connected and as we can see you can see the words which are more prominent is probably the answer that is getting the most traction so i can see two very clearly innovative collaborative and i have personally wish to say integrated as well there because i believe we need to be much more integrated in the way we look at and do systems thinking and that should change 
as we go through this entire learning from this situation that we are all together in. Strategic is also coming up and I think that was also brought in from our uh, panelists point of view Tony mentioned that how survival sustainability is actually teaching us or is giving us the path to survivability and beyond strategy to really seeing how you survive. Let's move on to the so thank you very much participants that's really interesting. Would any of the panelists want to make a comment maybe Tony Ram anyone would want to make a comment on what we just saw as a result of the poll on Menti? Tony, Ram, Arindam, any quick? Yeah, I, I think what you said, um, Seema, about systems thinking is really important. Um, we, we view a, a business as nothing more than a system. It's uh, people, assets, and processes that deliver products and services. Um, that system, in almost every case of all of us, has side effects. And we're going to have to... <clears throat> try to manage the side effects where we can. And in some cases that will be fine for the future. But in many cases to manage our side effects to a, a zero level, and one of the side effects might be CO2 production, to get to zero level, you have to completely transform your energy matrix or completely transform your product portfolio. And so I think uh, very soon uh, what we're going to see is the need for businesses to demonstrate to the finance sector, um, to uh, employees, that we are actually able to transform our business into something that's sustainable and capable of operating in the future. Um, <clears throat> I don't think the transformation has been uh, costed into the current value of businesses. Um, nobody... Uh, looks at what it might cost to transform an energy matrix to have the same amount of electrical energy that we have today, but we now have a large cost. So the ability to manage this transformation, the ability to adapt to new laws, to adapt to uh, the changing external uh, factors uh, becomes the thing that the management team has to focus on. Yeah, I would agree with that, with what Tony said. I think uh, the uh, it's interesting that a lot of people brought about innovation as one of the key pillars because uh, traditionally the issue with innovation has been that uh, the view of innovation has always been very close. You know, you know uh, I think what we are now seeing is that uh, the the really interesting innovations from a sustainability perspective are coming more from smaller uh, players, be it small startups or uh, people working on the ground, uh, be it social projects or technology projects. And I think more and more companies are realizing that uh, that is where they need to keep their ear to the ground and uh, collaborate with these uh, non-traditional partners rather than some of the established larger forums where, you know, usually these kind of practices are discussed. So I think that's a completely, and that is uh, where, where the sustainability team there really has to now expand their uh, reach, I would say, or their audience or their net to include uh, sources from as wide uh, ranging as academia or, uh, you know, like I mentioned, entrepreneurs, small startups. I think that there's a huge challenge which requires a greater amount of uh, interest and uh, greater amount of time spent in uh, diving deeper into this. But that is what is expected of the sustainability teams as well now. So I think there's a greater onus on us to go look for uh, innovative solutions. Uh, just to add to what Ram said, I think SDG 17, that's all about partnership. I think that's extremely important. It's not only partnership among businesses, but between business, the government and society at large. And of course, the development sector. I think all businesses need to build up the capabilities, the capacities to be engaged, to engage efficiently and effectively with different kinds of stakeholders. Because nobody, no business can do it alone. Huh? It's a tough task. It needs to be done by everyone together. And just to add to that, um, if, if you think of uh, only sustainable businesses being around in the year 2050 that are able to operate there, then logically <clears throat> value chains are made up of sustainable businesses. Uh, and the businesses that fail along the way will cause problems to that value chain. So taking a 
a much wider look at the business, not just my business, but the whole value chain that I operate in and asking, is that going to be sustainable in the future? Uh, again, becomes a key um, uh, responsibility of the senior management. Thank you. That, that's, that's really, uh, you know, I think resonates with what the participants were also putting out as their responses. And, um, and it's a good segue into the next question that I want to pose first to uh, Tony and uh, Ram, that um, what are the big opportunities that you see in this situation? So COVID has happened, of course. It has impacted the growth. Our roles are changing. And you mentioned what needs to change. What are some of the big opportunities in this situation? So Tony and then Ram. Thanks, Seema. Um, yes, I think um, we should never let a, a good crisis go to waste. And, and we have managed to change a lot of mindsets um, just by looking at COVID. And it's really a dress rehearsal for my view of climate change. The issue with climate change is there won't be a vaccine. So if we get into this situation because of climate change, there won't be a way out. So <clears throat> going back to the logic of sustainable businesses, the unsustainable businesses will struggle, uh, which means that sustainable businesses should be able to grow um, by taking up that market share. So <clears throat> we, we would see over the, the next 30 years, um, maybe a smaller number, of sustainable businesses, but much bigger and much well, much better controlled. And, and that change, uh, I, I think you can see uh, some businesses we've already talked about, some of the airlines maybe not making it, uh, maybe uh, some of the other <clears throat> businesses that are around the world will struggle. Um, but the ones who are in the right place, the ones that are correctly backed, the ones that have the right systems in place, um, will be able to grow into that market share. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity there. And as Ram said, you know, the, the danger is that a lot of this ability to transform comes from new businesses because they don't have uh, legacy assets. They don't have legacy mindsets. Um, so I think learning from COVID, you know, we can work at home. Everybody said you had to go to the office, but we're now more efficient working from home. So uh, mindsets get changed, uh, beliefs get changed, and I think we should use this um, crisis to uh, to encourage that and to encourage people to think outside the box. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tony's uh, phrase that Tony used, that's the exact phrase I was thinking of when we were having these discussions about never let a good crisis go to waste because uh, we've had to think on our feet. And uh, I echo almost every single sentiment that uh, uh, has been shared uh, right now in this discussion. Uh, the two major, the main, different, the main opportunity here is to be able to do things that primarily, previously we thought we couldn't do, which is like influence long-term systemic change or long-term behavioral change, which is something we were all resistant to, because you're like, you know, we are too caught up in our day-to-day -day operations to affect any massive, uh, you know, systemic overhaul or, or different way of working, be it remote working or you know, be it uh, uh, working with a smaller uh, amount of uh, resources available. And I think this is almost provide forced us into that situation and the companies that are better prepared to realize that they need to continue on the same path. And the ones who aren't have been hastily forced to reevaluate their systems and processes to see uh, how can we, you know, prepare ourselves better for a future which will have many more such occurrences where, uh, you know, things uh, may not be under our control. So I think influencing uh, employee behavior, stakeholder behavior, as well as instituting long-term process changes, which earlier would have taken maybe five to 10 years to really influence. I think this has maybe helped us uh, do it in a much shorter period of time. And uh, I was just on a team call just before this and the overwhelming consensus is like, you know, why can't we continue to work uh, in a similar way once we get back to normal? Why do we have to go back to the same way of working? You know, uh, I, I, I can't tell you the number of times over the last uh, few years I've heard at climate conferences about, you know, oh, the ironic uh, nature of us have flying from all the way around the world, you know, guzzling all that fuel to meet in person where the technology is available, where we can continue to do a lot of this stuff remotely. And uh, freakishly, now it is uh, in a situation where we have no other option but to do that. 
but we're already seeing some of the positive effects on the environment you see these photos every day of you know the uh, water clearing up the air clearing up uh, a lot of the animals returning to their natural habitats so i think it's very important we learn lessons from this and uh, because uh, like tony said uh, climate uh, i mean if we think the impact of covid is a big wait till you see some of the impact climate change is going to have in the next 5 10 years i think that will fundamentally should scare people into not going back to the way things were so there is a huge opportunity to i mean we it to, to have a to basically get people's ear earlier it was much more difficult i think the buy in in terms of discussion around sustainable ways of working uh, maybe it was at 50% earlier now it's at 80% purely because you know people can see the effects that this sort of situation can have thank you thank you and um, i i i have a question for arindam on this as well so we heard that you know um, there are legacy businesses which are learning how to you know uh, reinvent themselves and are trying to you know find opportunities and uh, to work through this crisis and there are new businesses as well who are probably more agile more dynamic now my question is that um, you probably have both type of businesses in your um, portfolio how do you help your clients to become more sustainable adapt more to these changes or what you are in them thanks so uh, seema i'll break it up into two parts one is the pre covid uh, era <laughs> so i mean it was a part of our mandate when you look at the rabo bank mission it's called growing a better world together so we just do not talk of financial uh, financing and investments we talk about network so one of the key things we do is for any client in a sensitive sector uh, we have a network of organizations from the development sector from the academia etc who help out our clients on their sustainability journey it's extremely important to connect the dots and to help our clients on their sustainability journey we help them on framing their sustainability policies and uh, we also help them in getting the right kind of uh, to be part of the right kind of networks huh? that, that's extremely important and now what we are seeing is <coughs> post covid first is as the example you gave of you know esg compliant companies doing better larry fink has recently made a statement that among his portfolio the esg compliant uh, companies are performing much better than the others i mean that's a big statement because their portfolio is huge for black rock certainly just a couple of days back there was a report by snp dow jones a similar kind of result that for the uh, for the uh, esg uh, leaders uh, the, the, their performance and the results are much better during the covid period the way i look at it is uh, for the front runners uh, uh, who are already front runners i think the journey becomes more certain for them and they are validated in all the assumptions that have made about all the risks that might come about i mean recently there was a food and land use coalition uh, and they made a statement saying that uh, uh, key action needs to be taken to make the food systems uh, to ensure food security it's extremely important statement they make and they made three key takeaway points but what is important here is all the front runners in the food and agri business space including unilever in, including olam including pepsico including rabobank yara etc they are all signatories the other point i would like to make it is uh, pre covid a lot of the climate uh, mission that a lot of businesses embarked into it looked a lot fuzzy it looked abstract for a lot of individuals lot of businesses and lot of industry because they said well there's nothing much that we can do about it we will, i'm sure somebody is going to come up with a solution we'll never face a calamity but now with covid a risk that very few in fact nobody could predict and the kind of deep impact it has across the globe across continents across supply chains across businesses i think it's made it very clear to all businesses that when they have to rebuild it has to be done differently it has to be better Uh, the message uh, i think is loud and clear as to what a systemic uh, risk can do to your business and your people so i think the s part of esg is going to be emphasized a lot more 
with uh, you know <clears throat> worker protection job protection working conditions being made extremely important and that's a journey we as a financial institution will play with a with our clients to see what are the best practices being uh, followed by different corporates in our portfolio anywhere in the world and how do we get the knowledge to the others who require that knowledge thank you thank you arindam very very good to hear uh, that from the covid learning the in, the focus is going to shift to the s or the people because people actually are at the center of all this we need to change their behavior we need to also tell them how to protect themselves and the planet so people really are at the center of all of this so thank you so much time to now move on to our next uh, you know um, uh, uh, mentee question and uh, which will just come up to uh, on the slide right now uh, again uh, requesting everyone to go back to menti.com with the same code what are the opportunities for increasing sustainable competitiveness in a downturn we'll give a little minute for everybody to put in their answers so i see again very nicely uh, you know collaboration digitization new products and sub services supply chain to india collaboration circularity resource efficiency so i think one of the biggest messages from the last two questions and our discussion is that we can't survive these episodes alone we need to collaborate we all need to build or rebuild better together with people as focus as was mentioned so thank you very much for again participating in this um now i i i would like to uh, you know uh, take some questions from the floor um we already have a lot of questions uh, from the uh, you know um, uh, floor already uh, so um, maybe i would just uh, in no particular order but maybe just start with a question which is directed to a panelist uh, it is to ram uh, and um, the question is uh, ram uh, that wbcst and global network partners engage primarily with large companies so do you think we miss out by not engaging more with the smaller innovators and how should we involve them in our discussions in furthering the sustainability agenda over to you now that's a very good question and uh, uh, i mean i think there is a i think we've discussed this uh, at various uh, wbcst forums and panels before but how do we you know offer different modes of engagement for some of these smaller uh you know or newer companies who may not be able to become full time members but you know there has to be other ways of engagement i think we already are exploring some different ways of engagement uh as an aside you know uh, companies should always look to bring identify new uh, innovations and you know entrepreneurs startups on their own and try to bring them to the table i think there is a uh, i think maybe arindam can uh, even expand on this there is always a scope for uh, looking at you know scaling up or investing in some of these small smaller ideas as well and i think that's what a lot of these and that's what the collab that's where the collaboration angle comes in because uh, the big the issue isn't that there aren't enough solutions available and the issue isn't even about visibility in 2020 there's plenty of visibility the issue is maybe sometimes there is too much visibility and you're not able to scale up some of these solutions so i think that's where that is a role that you know uh, both wbcsd as well as some of the larger conglomerates have to play is in uh, collecting some of these filtering th these ideas uh, putting money uh, or you know putting your hat on certain ideas where you think you know can have a larger impact and then helping them scale up uh, a lot of these solutions may not necessarily be feasible you know in 2020 but with the right kind of investments and the right collaboration uh, many of them could be in say by 2022 or 23 or even by 25 and looking at the kind of windows that we have uh, that is a fairly reasonable uh, time frame in which to effect some real change so i would say uh, utilize more of these forums and bring a lot more of these 
the smaller players uh, you know can bring them uh, give them a larger window or a larger canvas to work with uh, seema can i add one statement to that please please uh, so i would like to look at it a little differently you are looking at 200 of the largest corporates on mother earth now all of them they have business partners they have dealers they have vendors they have suppliers now all all their business partners are not big corporates huh? when we are looking at sustainability we are looking at systematic or supply chain sustainability so automatically when we are speaking of a large corporate we are speaking of hundreds and hundreds of businesses who are associated with that corporate and that corporate has to drive sustainability within the entire supply chain ha huh? so the way it works is if you are talking of uh, say the largest financial institution or the largest manufacturer of a certain commodity in this world they are working with thousands of small businesses so it's all included if you look at the have a su supply chain perspective huh? it's they are not getting eliminated in this process thank you thank you and i i i think uh, both the comments are very very useful uh, yes uh, the value chain of large corporates is the biggest ecosystem for driving transformation uh, on sustainability and that should be the first thing that corporates should do just not look at their own selves but the entire value chain and 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 basically innovate solutions around business models in the value chain and that can drive a whole lot of transformation and the other thing of course is create this very vibrant ecosystem where you bring in the disruptors and they are also a part of this ecosystem i think both both are really important so um moving on to the uh, next uh, you know question uh, which is not directed to any particular panelists but i think uh, you know maybe tony if i could request you the question is how are you testing that your current sustainability strategy is capable of mitigating risks associated with current and i would say even future pandemics and do you foresee that focus on sustainability the traditional esg by top management is because of this crisis increased or is it actually decreased so tony and then after that if anyone would like to supplement sure um <clears throat> that's a great question um uh, obviously if we talk about being sustainable then managing through uh, a number of crises over the uh, coming years is going to be important so Uh, as part of our sustainable business strategy we we also have a, a developed crisis management plan and so we found that the businesses that um have done a lot of drills and actually <coughs> uh, spent time rehearsing uh, have fared much better uh, they've got their plans in place really quickly um and so they've managed to uh, to operate many of our businesses are still factories are still operating um and obviously uh that's forced us or the, the situation has forced us to change how we operate um but nonetheless we're still making product and uh, that's that's still going forward so um the strategy does seem to be working i think in the future um managers are, are going to bring into the equation risk um we see a lot of questions and things around um changing the overall environment that business operates in i think we have to use uh, the 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 fact that we have businesses um but we have to minimize our side effects to slow down the change and then we have to be become much better at, at transforming quickly uh, and so the, the covid has given us a a real opportunity to practice uh, crisis management in a in a very realistic way thank you uh, ram or arindam anyone would like to supplement well uh, two yeah, short go on, points arindam. yeah i'm yeah. no, going arindam sorry sorry please go huh. okay thanks so two quick points here yeah. uh, i mean there is going to be damage huh? let's face it there's going to be damage in some sectors there going to be collateral damage huh? because this was just not foreseen and the scale is unprecedented the scale of disruption but the point here is again what we had discussed earlier there is evidence that the most sustainable companies are doing better than the unsustainable companies so that's the lesson out there for the smaller companies who will be struggling for for liquidity or solvency or markets or the lack of demand 
that when they rebuild the business, they have to do it better. The other point I would like to make is from our bank's perspective. Uh, I mean, we were rated by Sustainability as the most sustainable bank among the financial institutions globally. And one of the comments they had made, they had said that chances, they had concluded that the chance of disruption to Rabobank is negligible due to its social and environmental policies. Huh? It's not that uh, we will not be hit by the COVID, but the point they are making is whenever there is a calamity, I mean, from a sustainability perspective, from a disruption, pers disruption perspective, it's the sustainable companies who are going to come out better than the others. Huh? So that's an extremely important lesson, and that's the story we need to tell the uh, business world. I absolutely agree uh, with both the panelists, what they've said. I, I think it comes down to having um, sustain, like I said earlier on my first point, it comes down to having sustainability be a fundamental part of your corporate planning and strategy and, you know, and of course, carrying out uh, materiality and uh, risk assessments on a more frequent basis to constantly reevaluate the uh, you know, importance of uh, various risks. Uh, you know, uh, we all know that there are, there are things we are finding out on a annual or you know, even shorter basis. And I think it's very important to realign with the risk teams and the finance teams about uh, what is a priority you know, for the immediate uh, future for the next five years, 10 years, and have strong and agile response uh, to these things. I and mean, it's very important not to be rigid in terms of strategy. Well, it's great to have a firm strategy, great to have good processes, but it's also very, very important to be very agile in terms of uh, reevaluating priorities and risks uh, as you go along. So I think it's very, I mean, for larger companies, that I think is the bigger challenge because uh, policies and systems and processes don't really change as quickly. So I think uh, it, 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 it's really important for the sustainability team to be able to drive the kind of flexibility. Thank you. Um... One question, interesting question that's there is, uh, and I, again, it, it can be answered by everyone. Uh, so it is uh, a question that, do you think consumers will shift to buying from local brands and locally produced uh, you know, goods rather than buying from multinational companies? So are we really at a stage where we are reimagining capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really interesting when you talk about that. Um, most people don't know where things come from. Now, they know where the, the business may be uh, located, um, but rarely do people know the details of where things are made. And, and so that decision is difficult for people to make. When we, when we used to fly, I used to ask people, uh, did you pick the airline with the lowest CO2 content? And people looked at me strangely because no one, of course, knows which airline has the lowest CO2 content because it's not public. So one of the things that we see uh, in the future is not particularly reimagining capitalism, but the way businesses work will have to be much more transparent uh, because if we're going to have proper product labeling, then we're going to have to map all our supply chains. We're going to have to uh, build uh, the control systems. Uh, for business um, so that business is able to label its products um, <clears throat> if, if you don't know where things come from uh, and many businesses don't never mind the customers but uh, uh, that becomes impossible so I, I don't see it as reimagining capitalism rather using capitalism developing it making it more transparent um, and then allowing people to eventually make these kind of decisions yeah uh, just to add to Tony's point, uh, I think I spoke something about influencing sustainable consumption. And I think that's where messaging and communicating sustainability becomes very, very important. Because uh, to be very honest, uh, the average consumer today is not really, is more looking more at costs rather than uh, making a more sustainable choice. You know, you have few products and a few uh, small part of the uh, overall pyramid, which is, you know, uh, looking actively for sustainable products. But a larger part of the population is still looking at cost. Uh, but I think as, uh, like what Tony said, when you start becoming more transparent and you start looking at things like carbon pricing and water pricing, the true costs and the true effects of uh, products are really, uh, there's no way to you know, uh, hide them. And I think that along with um, uh, changing uh, demographic 
is going to change the way people demand what people demand of companies and the kind of uh, the manner in which they consume as well. Uh, I mean, it, it's not 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 any of the three panels here, but if you look at you know technology and the way uh, electronics are consumed, uh, surprisingly, that is the one area where it is uh, the they have the shorter shelf life. Where previously we used to look at electronics as probably having the longest shelf life and having you know uh, longer life cycles uh, in the system. But now you look at mobile phones or any kind of technology and the uh, the rate at which people change or you know or uh, uh, add uh, to their products is much uh, faster uh, but you do uh, you know and some other products see customers looking for you know be it fair trade or organic or uh, you know uh, socially or environmentally less impactful products so i think uh, you know, with transparency with greater reporting with things like mitigation pricing and uh, with once that comes to the fore uh, it is but natural that you know uh, people will start looking towards products that not only uh, you know have a cost advantage but also benefit the uh, you know population as well as the environment at large you will see that shift happening uh, i would just like to add one point i think uh, you know because of this crisis the way policy makers and governments are going to look at it is from the rely from a resilience perspective even businesses is to how families societies and countries can be more resilient resilient to such shocks so anything and everything that needs to be done to make society more resilient to make businesses more resilient to be able to absorb some such cost with the minimum disruption is going to happen and that's where corporates and businesses need to be extremely agile and react to the new situation whatever is the you call it there is bound to be an emphasis on resilience yes i agree the resilience will be very important and how we rebuild uh, better and include resilience and how do we actually look at green recovery and not just economic recovery green economic recovery is something that we should really think about let me move on to another question that has come uh, you know from uh, the floor uh, which is uh, basically saying that um, would there be greater scrutiny um you know um around um you know because of this covid crisis governance of companies you can see companies who are having not a great time and uh, you know uh, they they their assets uh, are being you know uh, are diminishing and you can see their market performance so would there be greater scrutiny on uh, companies especially around governance issues um such as you know um Uh, the pay disparity that is normally noticed between you know the top um, uh, level executives and the and the and the balance uh, executives so would covid also result in uh, the est lens being put much more strongly onto companies especially on governance social and environmental issues uh, as we are talking so any thoughts on that from the panel please um hi sima uh, sorry okay oh. continue go ahead go ahead thanks uh, well sima the way i look at it is uh, at this point of time for a lot of businesses it's a question of survival let's face it they need to survive but in the medium term i think we are going to see a systemic change in how businesses look at uh internally the risk mitigation system the risk management system the partnership partnerships the strategy uh and governance is going to play an extremely extremely important role and especially from a in, investors lens uh governance along with ens especially s is going to become a lot more critical i think it's going to happen I would probably add that um you know businesses and top executives are going to continue to think but I think the mindset that um these additional risks uh, that come from the changes in the world around us uh, are not actually going to impact our business will change and so I I tend to agree with Adam that um people will then develop their risk management Uh, piece there's an, another interesting question is 
if the ROI goes down, we don't take the right the decision, even if it's uh, putting us in a, a better place sustainably. But I think um, that happens if you don't include risk. So I, I think that um, senior executives will be looking much more at risk because if you don't manage your risk, then future opportunities will evade uh, will evade you. And so. <clears throat> um, those top executives that then do that will obviously be successful and their pay will be linked to success. So I, I don't see it as a complete change. I just see it as a development of the way businesses work and <clears throat> adding new things. And, and COVID is, is going to give us a, a new language. I think we'll move away from sustainability to sustainable. We'll talk about resilience and risk uh, much more than we talk about environment and social. Yep. And just to one small point to add to that, I think you'll see a lot of this happening unconsciously, as in it'll just be a part of uh, uh, what uh, Tori called earlier survival strategy. I think you will see uh, they may not consciously set out to uh, have a greater or you know, ESG focus on it, but the nature of the world post COVID and the way of the economy has to rebound. You will see automatically the ESG uh, stringency increase. And I think it may not necessarily be conscious, but you will see a lot of unconscious. Uh, change from this. Mm -hmm. When boards start asking CEOs, you know, if COVID can happen, what else can happen? And That's the obvious yeah. answer is that to be, well, climate change, well, water shortage, well, mass migration that's unplanned. And these things could affect our business. Our supply chain could be, be disrupted. Ah, well, then we need to start um, studying this in much greater detail. And I think that, as Ram says, will happen almost subconsciously, but the language will will start yep. to change to support them. Thank you. Uh, I have a little follow-up question on this. So uh, it's true uh, what you said, Tony, that uh, uh, as, as when boards start to ask, you know, that um, if COVID can happen, what else can happen? Uh, and of course, then those risks, uh, you know, matrices will change. The indicators that you need to use would expand much more and the language will change. But uh, what about the, uh, you know, the uh, regulatory uh, ecosystem and environment? Do we see, and here it is more, I would say I'm coming here, of course, globally, yes, but also in countries like India, for example. Do you see that, uh, you know, um, there will be greater realization on the part of the people who make the policy and the regulation uh, and greater focus on, uh, you know, or great, uh, greater ability to look at raising ambition, let's say, on climate issues or asking for, you know, companies to take on more measures uh, for issues on water, climate, etc. What is, what do you feel? How would it, uh, you know, pan out closer home in India and especially in the uh, policy ecosystem? Any thoughts, uh, Tony, Ram and uh, also sure. Arindam? <clears throat> I've, I've often asked the question to, to many people, if, if everybody in the world and every business followed the law as it's written, is the world sustainable? And I've yet to hear anybody say, yes, it is. So therefore, it has <laughs> to change. Um, politicians, of course, are by definition politicians, and they can only move at the pace that is dictated by the acceptance of the mass populace. And so this education of people, look, this is what can happen if it all goes wrong. I think will give governments greater confidence to be more aggressive, um, to be more aggressive on, on carbon pricing, to be more aggressive on managing biodiversity, for instance, be more aggressive on um, emissions, noise. Um, because people have now seen nice blue skies in, in Mumbai, uh, something I've never seen in the past 10 years until now, um, I kind of like it. And so if a government was to say, well, we should look at, at, at um, strengthening emission regulations on cars or keeping cars off the road because people should work at home, then more and more people start to support that. So I see the, the politicians gaining confidence because the mass public will support these moves. Yeah, I mean, it's often, I mean, I think I spoke about when you talk about risk uh, management and you know, how companies prepare themselves for uh, situations such as, uh, I think the most difficult and I think the most difficult one to plan for is regulatory risk. 
because a lot of it is not it happens very fast and a lot of it is not under our control uh, but having said that and there is a great opportunity for the government itself to uh, look at uh, you know they ha- they basically have industries and uh, the consumers and the average and the population right now listening to everything they say you know uh, more carefully and i think it's a great opportunity for them to use this to complete to again help drive behavioral change by instituting smart regulatory policies and this is a very very good opportunity uh, but it's up to us to uh, as as in, as industry as companies to really explain to them what what can or what can't be done and what is realistic to, uh, in terms of uh, achievable so i think um, while it is difficult and it's uh, the one thing that's not too much in our control uh, there should definitely be a dialogue um, between industry and uh, um, and uh, the government not just on how to come out of this but how to prepare for the next time something like this comes around and that's really well, important because i don't think we're going to voluntarily create a sustainable world it will have to be mandated um yeah. and that process of mandate as the government gets more confidence is really important because businesses can only move at a certain pace and the communication collaboration becomes very important um uh, but there will be pressure from the the financial markets that we can show that we can manage regulatory risk and that we can um change our, our management our processes our location whatever um so that we can remain sustainable when the law does change and and i think it's uh, inevitable it will i'd just like to add one point even before covid there were always dilemmas when sustainability decisions or plans were being made uh, decision i mean there was a conflict between at times business development and risk management in terms of incremental investment versus roi so these conflicts were always there these dilemmas were there and at times whether you are a policy maker you are a regulator or you are a board member it was always easy to take the you know the it was always uh, prudent to take the easy way out it was very easy to do that but i think as both the panelists mentioned that this gives an opportunity within businesses within the regulators within the policy makers is to push through important agenda which otherwise before covid was more difficult because i think the acceptance is going to be politically easier now as a they will get the buy in of a lot more stakeholders today than they would have had 3 months back I think the other one that's important is the insurance industry as well because um people who can't get insurance will not be able to operate um but we do actually reduce our ROI by paying our insurance uh and so once the risk debate and the uh the changes to the law become mainstream um then then I think um we're on the right path thank you thank you that's that's very interesting and um uh, this there's a question to the panelists to um uh, from the floor which says um and if i understand it correctly uh, what are the likely revisions in sustainability goals um if any because of this growth impacted scenario are there going to be any revisions would companies be actually you know uh saying that if the goal was to met in 2022 would it say mean that they would revise it to 2025 i think this is what the question is so would companies be revising their sustainability goals in a growth impacted scenario well, i uh, can't speak for all companies but uh, uh from our perspective we are pretty much on track to keep to our sustainability targets as per 2025 uh where the difference has been is in the oper- operationalization of uh, some of these targets i think the investment grade uh, decisions may be pushed a little further uh, maybe not this year maybe to next year uh, but in terms of while the individual year on year targets may have small revisions i think from a longer term perspective our target for 2025 is still uh, pretty much you know untouched we're not really looking at it uh, but uh, what i do Uh, feel is that you know a lot of these smaller companies uh, are suppliers vendors who have uh, targets such as uh, you can take the waste management uh, and the epr targets they are the ones who are really going to struggle because there is significant financial outlay required in terms of 
matching certain regulatory commitments for you know from an environmental perspective you might see a bit of defaulting over there but uh, from our side from the larger i mean you know, the larger horizon there's not really much of a change uh, you can expect few fluctuations on a year on year basis though. i think it's difficult to generalize as ram said for the large corporate front runners uh, i don't think there's going to be any change whatsoever because if uh, such stringent targets were taken pre covid they will push it through post covid to uh, smaller companies would struggle again as ram mentioned they will have to look at all the commitments they have made and depending on how well their business is doing they may need to push back some of the commitments huh? so uh, we'll have to wait and watch it's too early to comment on that or to generalize i think it's interesting I'm part of a 150 year old conglomerate um mr bill has said to us all the other day that this too will pass um and so the company does take a longer term view um and and so uh the targets will continue i don't think the strategy will change we'll continue to try to build uh sustainable businesses that are able to operate in in the new world that uh, is coming our way yeah uh, thank you i think that's that's uh, very important that uh, companies uh large companies probably would be able to um manage uh, you know disruptions and especially the, the companies that we have on the panel because of their you know deep sustainability strategies probably able to manage but for the smaller companies or companies who have not looked long term and built contingency plans this disruption uh, could mean that some of the investments and targets and goals do do take a little uh, change in plans uh but i think more or less large companies would continue to you know be on track uh, we have uh, many many questions uh, and it's all very good questions but um, mm. it's rather difficult to take all of them it's just a testimony to the great insights that the panelists have been giving us and i really want to thank each one of them uh, for uh, giving us um, uh, you know a very deep dive into the uh, you know the subject uh, sharing their own experiences uh in terms of their companies and their own uh, you know strategies as well as commenting on the larger ecosystem how it is going to really evolve in this uh, um, growth impacted world um i think there are so many key takeaways that i don't think i can manage to really you know uh, uh, say what the main takeaways are except to say that definitely we can see that you know companies who embed sustainability deeply into their business models are much better prepared for any of such disruptions uh, the two companies here as well as many members of the wbcst and indian companies as well have shown this and are uh, and therefore that i believe would act as a you know as a message for uh, other companies to also follow uh, also i think um messages coming out from today are that um the overall uh, you know path towards sustainability uh, is important and that needs a lot more innovation innovation actually leads to transformation and transformation also means that you remain more relevant competitive and you are not disrupted so there's a link between sustainability and innovation that also came out from the uh, the poll that we did which is very very important uh, to keep in mind and therefore that transformation innovation within our uh, value chains or outside are very important uh, for for companies to keep in mind also very uh, a message that came out was that you know companies which are sustainable would attract much more patient capital much more investment because financial sector uh, would have its own risk mapping now based on this learning from covid boards of course will also ask those questions so overall if there is you know a company which is looking to uh, you know change the way it's been looking at esg this time there are a lot of learnings for that company and that company sooner or later companies need to get this 
ESG framing into their business models. And that's what will help them both tide over the financial you know, investments they're looking for from the consumer point of view, as well as from a regulatory eventually point of view. Collaboration seems to come out as a big message. And I think that's what all these forums, CII, WBCSD are all about, providing that platform for collaboration. And I'm sure with, uh, you know, I want to also thank WBCSD for providing this platform for us to share our, you know, understanding and learnings. And I think more of this has to be continuously done uh, and from a solutions point of view. And it's great to have, have you know, multiple, you know, um, participants who can, uh, you know, participate in this knowledge sharing. With this, I would like to hand this back to um, WBCSD Joe uh, to take us to the end of the session. Thank you. Great. So, um, so thank you very, very much, Seema. I'd like to thank um, everyone who's participated today um, and who has, and, and additionally, all those who've posted a question. We had a lot of uh, questions with a lot of variety and that's really appreciated. Um, Tony, Ram, Arendon, thank you very much. I especially want to thank Seema um, and our partners at the Confederation of Indian Industry uh, for moderating today. Um, this was a very good discussion you know, on the challenge of achieving sustainable competitiveness. And this is, you know, the, this is the, the goal of all the uh, companies that we work with at WBCSD, where you know, together we're looking um, to lead, um, to transform, create change and to succeed. Um, and I thought today, um, you know, what I really reflected on um, from this discussion was the speed at which um, things have happened in, in the last couple of months and, and the speed of the lockdown, but also now the speed of opening up and depending on where you are in the world, that same surprise at how quickly um, everything gets shut down, you know, we're, we're each of us starting to experience again this opening up coming sooner than we anticipated or, or we, were, we were prepared for. Um, so, so just like the way the world changed with something as small as straws, almost overnight plastic straws were gone, or I'm from Europe, but I live in India and I, I returned one year recently and I was stunned at all of the shops for vaping that were suddenly everywhere. So when the conditions are right, whether it's for something positive, negative or neutral, um, change does come extremely quickly. And the only ways that, um, that often actually like COVID aligned with dramatic policy action. And, and the only things for business to do are to build economic resilience and environmental resilience. And again, this goes back to the mission of the World Business Council, um, supporting our members in decarbonizing um, and building resilience. So um, to all the, the members of WBCSD, we look forward to continue working with you uh, on this agenda. Um, that's us and, and our global network partners around the world who you're, you're engaged with. Um, and to, to those companies not yet part of the World Business Council, you know, do get in touch um, to find out what being a member means, what it asks of you and, and you know, what you can achieve through membership. And um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, a couple of things on um, what you saw today. So the first thing is we, we put up some slides at the start about um, ESG uh, data and performance of companies who were leaders in ESG or leaders in sustainability. And I just want to say a couple of things about that. So because there was a question. So, of course, um, you know, all financial performance needs to be looked at extremely carefully um, before any investment decisions are made. And of course, we are just, you know, six weeks, two months into the COVID crisis. So drawing um, strong conclusions, um, you know, should be, should be done, um, you know, with, with caution. But at the same time, um, there are whole investment houses betting on the strength of uh, financial performance of companies that manage their environmental, social and governance factors well. And we heard at length from Arendom, who works for, for one of those uh, companies who see the strong correlation between ESG performance and, and resilience and, 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 before, and financial performance. So yes, there are always caveats and yes, these are just snapshots. And yes, we are just at the start of the COVID, um, um, you know, the, the economic impacts of COVID. But nevertheless, um, there are links between uh, sustainability and competitiveness and that's important. 
The second thing that I want to um, let you all know is that um, we showed the Mentimeter results up to about 30 responses each time, but, um, but many more have participated in those questions and we will capture the results in um, the report that we do. Um, and we'll also do the same with the, the virtual event that we run later on today on this same subject. And that report will be available on our, on our website. Um, and we will also email all of you, as well as everyone else who registered for this event, with the slide and the recordings and, and the summary. So you'll be able to click through and, and see all of that. Um, thanks very much. There will be um, another virtual event running this Wednesday and uh, virtual events running every Monday and Wednesday um, through May and June. So um, thanks once again to our moderator and our speakers and to all of you for participating. And um, I'll, I'll bid you adieu and uh, look forward to connecting virtually and in person one day, um, you know, as soon as we can. Thank you very much.